Hi everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Anthony. I'm one of the pastors here, usually hanging at Edgewood. I want to say hi to all the campuses and everyone viewing online. Hello to everyone. I'm so glad to be here this morning. I will share about my family. You may not look or hear or sound like what you're used to, definitely not like what you read on Facebook it's about perfect families. I obviously was born in Kenya. Most of my family are still in Kenya. And my parents were born there, and they were born in families and parents that came from polygamous families. That meant my grandfathers on both sides had more than one wife. Sounds so different from here, but here you can do it in sequence. There you can do it all together at <laughs> <to> one time. <laughs> but it looks, it looks like we read the story of David. I remember my uncle's stories growing up, and all their stories were all about fight and rivalries and hard labor from sunrise to sunset. They will be out there on the farms just working. Women and kids are like sometimes what we see in the Bible, they were considered nothing but properties and workers or a sign of wealth. So the more you had them, the more wealthier you were. We were raised uh, not to talk about all the drama and the ugliness that went around all the step families because there was just so much that went on, on all of them trying to fight and use every means they can get to get love from that one father. So you can imagine it, it was always fighting, fighting, fighting. And both... To make it worse, both of my grandmothers, after they had all these kids, they were abandoned. Raise them on your own, because he went on with other wives. And they were left. When you're left with no husband, you have no status, and you have no wealth. And then you have to work harder to grow, because everything comes from the ground. That time and their time was time of transition from European colonialism to them getting independence. So very few schools, very few hospitals that time, barely no roads. So you get sick, you have to go for a long, long distance or just depend on roots and traditional kind of medicine or witchcraft, whatever you can get. So it was hopeless, it was hard, it wasn't going anywhere. And my parents are born in that. Quickly, even after they got married, those who hated them and hated their mother and did everything, launched onto their young marriage and wanted to tear it apart. And they did. They had no chance of making it. By the time I'm born, my first earliest memories is to hear my mother cry. Domestic violence. There's no rights or legality or protection like you get from here. So they could do whatever they want. And all I could hear is her crying for her life. She's raising us like, keep secrets. Don't ask questions. Don't tell about all this drama outside here. 
No conflicts are solved, and therefore is hopelessness after hopelessness. Never heard a word, I love you. All you hear is blaming, like the reason you're lucky. You're lucky to have one pair of shoes a year. Because my brothers, my uncles, didn't have any until they went to high school. And then if they didn't went to school, they barely would have a shoe. So you didn't mind it all that. You're made to feel like it's your fault you're here. Last year, I saw this photograph of both my parents, and I was so glad to see it. Then my sister reminded me. She was older, so she had more memories. Remember that night? Like now? It's the night he tried to kill her for the last time. After he left, it took a week or so, with pulling needles and thorns and glasses, where he threw her and literally tried to take her life. It didn't happen once or twice. It happened many times. She raised all five of us running for her life. She literally, she knew Jesus when she died, but she died still running away because of this trauma and fear. Hopeless. How's your family? Yeah. <laughs> You thought it was bad until you hear that. Sometimes we read families and we see how people pay f post on social media and we think everybody else is doing fine <laughs> and mine is the worst until you hear what others are going through. How, when, how, how long have you gone without talking with your siblings? That was normal with me. That's the last time you talk with your father or your mother or your own kids. Go on and on without talking. Maybe some of you don't even know your father, don't know your mother, or don't know any of them. You wonder why you're here. Nobody ever explained to you why you're on this wall. And what you know maybe in your family is fights and abuse and addictions and arguments. Well, last time you saw your parent, they were behind bars. For some, going to jail is part of growing up. It's normal. You are made to feel like it's all your fault. You were born here. All you do is eat and sit and do nothing. All that's around us, you and me sometimes is just drug addicts, addictions to alcohol, to drugs. Feels like your best friend now is the phone video game, remote control, we've turned into a couch potato, and all our dreams is what we see on those tubes because everything else feels and looks so hopeless. You are raising yourself because there's no family, and no wonder being in a gang makes sense because of all the brokenness we see. Some we're waiting for, so afraid of what the next news will be about. Is it going to be about shooting, earthquake, teen pregnancy, ah. diagnosis from the doctors, looming death? We are so afraid, work so hard to make ends meet, so stressed out, chasing after the dream. So busy, you have no time for family, no time for yourself. You long, you long to be in a place where you can find some comfort, some unconditional love like a family. But all you find there is self-interest, manipulation, running away from ex, avoiding child support. It's all ugly, it's all hopeless. When is it ever gonna end? Is there a patriarch? Is there a father figure? Is there a matriarch? Is there someone who says? Is there someone who can control the thermostat in your house? I know, 
Some of us value beauty and looks, and the most beautiful person has the most power in your family. The most intelligent, the most athletic, the most good looking will give them power. Or if whoever walks, have a say. And then before we know it, kids are the ones bringing in money. Before we know it, kids are running that family. It feels hopeless. You live in lie after lie after lie, and you're tired of it. Sometimes you give authority to a little baby because of all the tantrums they throw. Because they feel poverty is looming. Uh, divorce is coming, and we'd rather forget what is coming and let that kid run the family. Feels hopeless. That's how David and his life was feeling as we look today. David was the young boy the father had forgotten. When a prophet comes to look for a kid to make him future king, this is all my kids. Like, don't you have another one? Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot him. I have a little boy out there looking after sheep. It was the little boy who was forgotten. Then he became king, and eventually he is in infidelity with Bathsheba, murders her husband, makes a baby with her, and the baby dies. So we see David had married many wives, had many concubines, had children. So we may not have all the genealogical record of David's wives, children, concubines, but we know of Absalom, we know of Ta Amnon, and we know of Tamar. Absalom and Tamar came from one mother, Amnon from another mother. Amnon was the one who was attracted to his half-sister, and we know what, that, what happened with that. Raped her, hated her. And then her brother now, Absalom, hated him, didn't speak to him. And that's the palace. That's what's going on in this palace of David. It may look good on the outside, like this picture will show. Maybe look something like this. They had everything they ever wanted, but they soon realized things and money can't buy love, can't fix a family. They need more than that. Absalom, we are told in the Bible, hated his brother, went two full years without talking. And what did David do with all this drama going on? Samuel says, now when King David had all these matters, all he did is he was angry. That's all. Classic passivity. Incredible paternal preoccupation he was. These kids have raised themselves in this palace without parental authority or discipline. And all this is the consequence of David's sin. They had all the material things they wanted. But in this palace, there was pandemonium going on. There was intrigue. There was jealous. There was hatred. All breaking out into murder and incest. And it was such a household that Absalom was born and brought up. Experiencing all these jealous and scheming parasites of his steps' mothers. And it's from that he learned. He was schooled very well from all that was going on. And he learned deception, learned rebellion, learned conspiracy. All this under King David. Absalom was quite a guy, wasn't he? Played his father for a fool. Absalom planned a party, a ship-sharing party. He invites even his father and all the brothers. And in this party, the whole intention is to go kill his stepbrother. And he killed. He had him kill. Then ran off to another family for three years. Ran to his in-laws. David, yeah, felt bad, but he still longed to see him. And then Absalom comes back to the palace. When he comes back, his father says, I ain't going to talk to him. I want to see him. For three years, they didn't talk. Absalom also, we are told, 
was such a good looking guy. It says in the Bible, in all Israel there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the top of his head to the sole of his foot, there was no blemish in him. Absalom was so famous with his good looks, including his spotless skin, prolific hair. When he cut his hair, he weighed it. It made the evening news. Hey, he cut his hair and it's awesome. He, he won top cover magazines, GQ and People magazine, year after year after year, the most handsome guy in Israel. He had big hair. But he also had a big head. He wanted his father's kingdom. And he had learned how to conspire. And we find that in 2 Samuel 15, 1 through 7. It says, in the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot on horses and with 50 men to run ahead of him. He would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him, Hey, what town are you from? And would say, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, Look, your claims are valid and proper. But there's no one here. There's no representative. The king is too busy. There's nobody here to help you. And Absalom would add, if only I, you know, see how I look, if only I were appointed judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or a case would come to me, and I would see that they receive justice. Also, whenever anyone approached him to kiss him and bow before him, Absalom would say, no, no, no. He would reach out to them and told them and kiss them. He turned it around. Absalom behaved in this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. And so he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. All this going on without David suspecting a thing. Stole the people's heart. Stood in the gate, hugged them, kissed them, warned their hearts, said bad things about his father, all false, all exaggerated. And before long, like a politician, he had the majority vote. He planned, I'll go back, I'll plan something, we'll go to the city of Hebron, where my father was enthroned and made a king, and I'll invite these people, they don't know why I'm inviting them, and over there I will be enthroned, I will be made king. All this David doesn't know it's going on. And he brought the people. So the conspiracy went on. It gained momentum in 2 Samuel 15, 12 through 16. And so the conspiracy gained strength. And Absalom's following kept on increasing. Then a messenger came and told David, the hearts of the people of Israel are with your son Absalom. Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, Come, we must flee. We must run because Absalom will kill us. We must leave immediately or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin on us and the city to the sword. The king's officials answered him, Your servants are ready to do whatever, Lord. The king chose us, they say. So the king set out and his entire household followed him. Listen, David abandons the city. He's running. He's becoming a refugee, running from his own son. He gets into a long war with his own son, Absalom. Eventually, Absalom gets killed in this war. That long hair he was bragging about got stuck in some tree. It's all in the Bible. And he was hanging up there. And he had told people, don't kill my son. And his own friend, General, said, forget this, and took some rods and hit him. And eventually they killed him. David cried and cried. Job was like, no, you can't be crying. He's put us through all this. 
story reminds us of how terrible sin can bring to our lives. It paints a sad portrait of once a mighty king of Israel. While once David was the man of action, he's now paralyzed from acting. While once David was just and right for all the people, now David is unable to do the right thing. David's inability to function as Israel's king is directly related to his sin. That David had been forgiven and he knew he was forgiven his failures, but the consequences of all his wrongs were eating him up and affecting everybody around him. And like him, you and I have our wrongs, but why do we keep doing them? The reason sins don't go away is because we still want to do them. We find satisfaction and assurance and validation and comfort and worth in some of the things we do, in some of the worldly things we like. For some, your career is your redeemer, is your savior. For some, your work, it's your God, you worship it. For others, to be famous in public recognition, it's your glory. For others, yourself, everything revolves around me and you, yourself has become the God. And the reason you can't kill that sin is because you worship you. And you can never bring that down. And we love these things. And somebody had said, we are what we love. That's the drama we find in David's family. Hopeless. Is there hope in us? Is there a thread we can find in all these failures? But David finds it when he hits the bottom, hits rock bottom. He's running. He's a refugee from his own son. And that's when he writes Psalms 3. And I start from verse 3. And he says, but you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. And then he says, I call out to the Lord, and he answers me. I don't imagine this is not like a simple, easy, comfortable call. It's like, I call to the Lord, and he answers me. I lie down and sleep. I wake up. I wake up because the Lord sustains me, he says. He's realizing the Lord's sustenance when he's lost everything. It's not his military might. It's not his good looks. It's not his past victories. It's the Lord himself that sustains him. He's running, but he's getting it now, thinking back to God's promises that we find in 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16. He remembers God telling him, when your, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, David, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. It's going to be your son who's build, who is going to build my temple. He is the one who will build my house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. It's thinking back of God giving this covenant. Hear this. I will be his father. He will be my son. When he does wrong, I'll punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love, my love will never be taken away from him. Your house, and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever, David, forever. In the Old Testament, this Hebrew word for love, hesed, is a standard technical term for God's steadfast love. 
It's the love that makes covenants and makes agreements. It stands for loyalty, joint obligation, faithfulness, goodness. This is where we find the love in the New Testament. We call agape love, unconditional love. That's the God who promises David and his future. And David did not understand this until now he's lost everything. When he's a refugee running, he understands God's steadfast love is enduring loyalty. It's rooted in an unswerving purpose of good. It can be stern. It can discipline waywardness, but it's still faithful. You and I inherit that agreement. He promised your house will be tied up with David. Because his promise goes and reaches to all of us. God's love has within it kindness, tenderness, compassion. But its chief characteristic is an unaccepted moral obligation. He don't quit on you. He doesn't quit on us. He said it's not just an emotional response to beauty and when things go well, he'll be there now. It's dedicated to our good. Whether we are responsive or not, God's unconditional love is there for you and for me. Love is up there. We study about other emotions and feelings of God, but love stands up there. In Deuteronomy 6, 5, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Jesus came and said, If you love me, keep my commands. Paul later writes, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of this is love. Therefore, get this, therefore, love is our main barracks, is our primary armor, it's our boot camp, it's our war plan. The enemy knows this. He wants to crush it, steal it, doesn't want us to get it. But love is the strongest affection we can have. Love is the hardest fudge in which we can craft our sharpest weapons. Without love, it's all empty. Life has no meaning without love. What have we learned so far? Is it all hopeless? Learn these points. Focus on the giver, not the gift. Focus on God himself and all the things, not the things he gives you. Sins have consequences. But this is the big one here. Consequences can't stop God's love. He said, he stayed first love fresh every morning. That's where the idea of family really comes from. From that kind of promise, that kind of God, that kind of unconditional loving person who from the beginning was a family in himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They were a family and therefore they gave us to be a family. And that's the thread to take away today. Take that thread of God's unconditional love and thread your own family with God's character, with God's person himself. Maybe you're a father or the father figure and you feel shamed for the things you haven't done and all the failures you haven't achieved. Don't count all the wrongs. Remember, all this will not separate you from God's love. Rely on God himself. He has stopped counting all your wrongs. You feel, is God like a mother also? 
We see that in Isaiah 49. It says, can a mother forget their infants? Yes, they can. Can they walk away from their babies? They do it all the time. But God says, I'm more loving than a mother. I have written your name in the palm of my hand. I will never, ever forget you. God will never forget you. Not in good times, not in bad times, not in war, not in peace. In deepest joy, in darkest night, God knows. God knows every page of your story and he will never Never forget you. About your kids. Kids need love. But guess what? We are all kids. We never stop needing love. It's in the war times they have seen kids who are never touched or spoken to or loved. They die. So they need to be touched and kissed and hugged and cuddled. That's how we learn to spread this within our families. And we never stop. The more we grow, the more we need affirmation of love from each other. We never outgrow that. Bring the thread of communication also from this unconditional love of God. Communication as couples and in your own family around dinner tables is how you express, is how you resolve, is how you talk about things and thoughts and wishes and create a bond. Some families never learn how to communicate, never eat together. Dinner time is fast food on your way out to the next thing. And we are like these egos. They may be brothers, but that's how they communicate. They eat each other, they steal from each other. This is a live shot I took, Anna Wingo but they eat and try to kill each other all the time. That's how some of our homes feel. How about teenagers? Get involved with their gadgets especially. Keep junk away from kids. Says if your child gets really, really mad that you took their phone or their game away, red flag, they're getting addicted. They're just like adults when you're addicted with alcohol or drugs or something. How about your step family? Stop pushing uncomfortable moments away. Don't avoid awkward moments when you're around your step family. Whether it's Christmas, summertime, Thanksgiving, bring this thread of steadfast love of God. Ask them questions just as though they were your biological kids. Love your step family. When you live here, call someone you haven't talked to for a while. When you go out here, summertime, you go to the ocean, don't just have fun. Make it meaningful. Have dinner time. Talk. Communicate with your loved ones. Text, if that's all you can do. Text one word, two words to those you haven't done for, for a while. I'm here to say I am here because Jesus has loved me. I am here because when there was no one to, he loved me. He got me. He saved me. He rescued me from all that drama. I love because he has loved me. Not because I have it all together. But it's because of Jesus I have overcome poverty. It's because of Jesus I have overcome addiction. It's because of him I have overcome hate and violence and racism. It's because of Jesus I am who I am today. <laughs> Peter comes to Jesus and says, how many times should I forgive my brothers and my sisters? Like seven times, right? He says, no, it's 77 times seven means you can't count. You can't count it how many times you forgive. And that's flowing from the love of God. Also means all the wrongs we have done cannot pay God back. He doesn't count all the wrongs I have done. He stopped counting all you ever done. 
He doesn't keep records. And that unconditional love is out here for you and for me, no matter what we have done. The good news is Jesus has stopped counting my mistakes and your mistakes. And he's calling you and me to his school of love. Not love up here. Love down deep here and bring it to your family. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you love everyone here today. You love our families. You love us just as we are. And we abandon our mistakes, we abandon what we think is good. We just come, we just come to you. And pray your healing love to find us where we are and to bounce us back into your unconditional love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 That's a powerful message. Thank you, Anthony. If the Lord has stirred your heart,